Good morning, church. I would remind you uh, real quick, if you have a praise or concern you would like lifted up during our worship service this morning, if you'll fill out one of the yellow uh, prayer uh, requests, prayer, prayer praise requests uh, slips and either drop it in the basket or uh, a deacon will pick it up uh, during our, our opening hymn or uh, you can come up and hand it to me as well. We continue on our journey through Lent as we step inside the story of Jesus' sacrificial stance for justice. We put ourselves in the picture so that we might take a closer look and let the ancient story open us to deeper conviction for our role as disciples of Christ. response to a visit to the temple in the midst of the busy, noisy, Passover tourist season is utter frustration turned to anger. With so much at stake, business as usual seems obscene. This can be true in, for us today as well. The routine nature of our everyday lives sometimes seems ludicrous in the face of the suffering around us and in the world. But taking a moment inside the scene where Jesus is overturning tables in the house of prayer for all nations can offer us a way to see what we actually might do to reassess our own actions and make our own corner of the world, our temples, a more welcoming place for all. Enter, enter the passion, enter the place we belong. you pray with me holy one as we come into this temple today we seek you we want to know what it was like oh lord to walk with you that last week the week we refer to as your passion story today we see a different side of you than we normally see help us oh god to fully understand the message you have for us in the scriptures today be with us as we fellowship with one another and open our hearts and minds to you. Come, gracious God. Come, Brother Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Rise up and make yourself known in our worship this day. To our Christ that we pray. Amen. I would encourage you to rise, embody your spirit, and join us in our opening song, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High.
kiddos come forward for our children's moment with Miss Janet. I took the cord with me. How's everybody today? Good? All right, well, today we're going to continue with our stories about Lent. And you remember last week's story was about Jesus going into, uh, on the back of a donkey and, and Palm Sunday and, and all of that. But before we get to today's story, we're going to uh, say our echo prayer again. But this time we're going to add some motions to it. So just repeat after me and do after me. So we will dare to join the journey. We will dare to join the journey. We will walk in your loving way. We will walk in your loving way. We will live your sacred story. We will live your sacred story through the things we do and say through the things we do and say all right amen amen so today's story we're going to experience a whole lot of emotions and as i call out a feeling you get to make that face so let's practice happy yeah all right angry Ooh, all right. How about sad? Okay, but you're going to have to listen carefully for the emotions, and then there's a little kicker here. You have to freeze your face in that emotion until I get to the next one. <laughs> all right, so you got it? All right, <clears throat> so when Jesus went to Jerusalem, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and everyone was excited. But when Jesus arrived at the temple, he was shocked. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those exchanging money so that people could buy the animals. This made Jesus angry. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep, who were more than, who were more than a little bit surprised. Jesus was still angry when he scattered the coins and turned over the tables of the ones exchanging money. He said to the people who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples were amazed. As they remembered that it's written, passion for your house consumes me. The Jewish leaders were irritated. That's a tough one, isn't it? As they asked, who gives you the right to do this? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered in a calm voice. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish leaders were confused, saying, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about how his own body comes back to life on Easter, a day of joy. Yeah. All right, you can relax your faces now, so you don't have to do that. So God gave us all of these feelings, and they all serve a purpose, including anger. Now, it doesn't mean you can go home and get angry at your brothers or your sisters or your mom or your dad, but there's a good purpose for anger. So there are times when it's okay to be angry. Even Jesus got angry. We just saw that in the story, especially when something was unfair. Many believe that one of the reasons Jesus was so angry is that the money changers were known to cheat people, especially the poor. I want each of you to think silently about this. When would it be a good time to be angry? And how can you express that anger in healthy ways so that you don't hurt someone else or you don't hurt yourself? So those are all things to think about. Now, let's all take in a deep cleansing breath through our nose and let it out through our mouth. 
And then let's close in prayer. And repeat after me. Loving God, help us live your story by being in touch with our feelings, even anger. Please give us the strength to express our anger in healthy ways so we can make your world better. Amen. All right, it's time for worship and wonder. I got out of order for those who were following me. Sorry. Yeah, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. Uh, any other yellow cards? Uh, we do have a few uh, concerns and praises that we'd like to lift up. Betty asked for prayers for the new chief of police um, and our police department um, and the fire department. Always good to keep those folks in our prayers. Michelle Walker asked us to continue to be praying for Norma uh, and her health as she's still pretty weak. Um, my husband and I would ask for prayers for um, brother-in-law Mike Jareen uh, in Iowa who's uh, struggling with some health problems. Uh, we also want to, of course, keep the G family, uh, the family of Chuck Rutledge, in our prayers um, at his passing this last week. And Casey Williams asked for prayers uh, for the family of Walt Morris, who passed this week as well. We do have a praise. Um, Amelia Rainwater won again, uh, gets another um, gold at State ISMA. Congratulations, wherever she went. <laughs> Good job. All right. Well, let's keep these um, prayers in our hearts as we go together to God in prayer. Will you bow with me? Oh, God of all, the temple of the world can be a busy, noisy place, oh, God. Too often the rule seems to be everyone out for themselves. Too often we don't stop to think about how our actions might affect others. Forgive us, O oh God. Turn us toward the temple of our hearts where you await. May we throw those doors open wide that you may come and fill every part of our hearts. You entered our story, O oh God, through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Holy One, we have lifted up concerns to you this morning, and I know um, that there are other concerns represented within this congregation, and so we want to pause just now to quietly and individually lift up our prayers of concern to you. God of grace, we are so thankful that you are always there for us. We might feel a distance sometimes, Lord, but it's most often because we've moved away from you. We've shut, our, shut the doors of our heart, and we can't let you in for some reason. But you're always there for us, ready to help us through very difficult times, to strengthen us with your love, and to carry us sometimes when necessary. And we are so very grateful for that. There's so many ways that you bless us in each and every day. And so we pause just now to quietly and individually lift up our prayers of thanks and praise to you. Thank you, O oh God, for all that you are and how you call each and every one of us your beloved. But we also know, Lord, that you call us to come together to do your good work and to be the body of Christ. And so we take our individual voices, we blend them together, and we say the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now it's special music. Special music. But don't go far, Danny. disciples are amazed, the scripture says, because they see Jesus' zeal for the creation of justice in the temple that day. It recalls to the minds the passage from the Psalms, the hymnal of the temple that describes the hatred that they fear would overcome Jesus and them as a result of this moment of righteous anger. The reading today is from Psalm 64, 8 through 16. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. When I made sackcloth for my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me. 
from sinking in the mire, and let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good, according to your abundant mercy, turn to me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is what I was afraid of. Tensions have been so high since we got to Jerusalem. And I saw Jesus get wound up in a way I have never seen before in these three years of following him. He's the one who sat with the children and sick people and talked with outsiders. So able to stay centered in a peace that frankly was beyond my understanding. But now he is so worked up, I'm afraid. That's it. I'm afraid in this moment that this is going to lead to trouble. Is this really the way to win over his people to his cause? By stirring, by causing a stir in the temple? Isn't it the Romans and the corrupt Jewish leaders that, ha that they have in their pocket that we should be targeting? But instead, He's yelling at the people who are trying to help these pilgrims follow the laws of the temple. And yet, I get it. I've been angry too. Not the people who are trapped in the system, but at the system itself. The way things are. I'm so angry at the way things are. How will anything change? Only when we all look at our part in it. Only when we see how we prop up the system because of our fear. And for those that benefit from it, because of our greed. Only when we search ourselves and cleanse the temple of our hearts will we be able to change be the change we want to see. So I will stay by his side no matter where this leads. Once upon a time, there was a lady who felt like her life and the world were out of control. And so she opted for some retail therapy. She went to the mall and she went into a new store she hadn't noticed before and she was shocked to see Jesus behind a counter. She knew it was Jesus. She, she recognized him from all the pictures. So she finally got up her nerve and he went, she went up there and she goes, you're Jesus, right? And he goes, yes. She goes, you work here? He said, well, I sort of own the place. She said, really? Well, what all is here? He said, oh, pretty much everything. You can walk up and down the aisles and find just about anything you could want. Why don't you do that? Go make a list. And when you've made your list, you come back and I'll see what I can do for you. She did just that. <laughs> She headed out with a piece of paper, and she was writing furiously. She couldn't believe all the wonderful things there were. There was peace on earth, no more war, no hunger or poverty. Writing down peace in the families, how wonderful, all harmony, no dissension, no drugs. And there was even careful use of our resources. She finally came back to Jesus and uh, had her long list there of things, and, and she gave it to him, and 
he looked at it and kind of studied it a minute, and he goes, no problem. And then he bent down behind the counter and was kind of rummaging around for a long time, and finally he stood back up and he laid on the counter all these little packets. She said, what's that? He said, oh, these are seeds. She said, wait a minute, I, I don't get the finished products? He said, no, 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 that's not how it works. You see, you come here with all your dreams and hopes. You look around and see what you really, really, truly desire. Then I give you the seeds. You take those home. You water them. You nurture them. Uh, you help them to grow. And then someday, someone else reaps the benefit. She left without any seeds. I thought this story was a beautiful illustration of what the church should be. <laughs> um, I know sometimes people come to the church just seeking to be fed and cared for, but what the church really is supposed to be is a place where we receive those seeds, those things that God wants to plant deep within our hearts, seeds that will grow our desire to feed and care for others. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we come into this worship and settle in in the story, Lord, uh, we ask you to help us picture ourselves in the story. Perhaps, Lord, you will do that through the scriptures. Or perhaps you'll speak to our hearts, O oh God. In whatever way it needs to happen, Lord, we pray that you will move us today. That by being in this picture calls us to be a, a better servant of you. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Christ we pray. Amen. So we are continuing our series entitled Entering the Passion. It kind of revolves around a book by A.J. Levine uh, by the same title. And um, so what we're doing here in Lent is we are walking through Jesus' last week on earth uh, before he went to the cross. And we're trying to picture ourselves in these stories, to really understand, to not just listen to them, to not look at them from afar, but to actually enter the story. And today's story is the story uh, that is often referred to as Jesus cleansing the temple. Now, all four of the Gospels uh, give us a perspective of this particular story. Uh, Mark and Luke, for them, it is day two in Jesus' week. In Matthew, this happens uh, right after he leaves the parade. He goes straight to the temple uh, in Matthew's Gospel. And then in John, uh, which uh, you heard um, reference to in the children's moment, uh, it happens actually much earlier in Jesus' ministry, actually right after his first miracle. But today we're going to focus primarily on Mark and the other two synoptic Gospels, Luke and Matthew. Um, and I know, even as I'm saying this, that some of you are already like, ugh, what do you mean they don't say the same thing? <laughs> it can really bother some folks. I know that when we have a, a similar story by different authors and we get very different stories, right? In fact, I've even had somebody say to me one time, well, which one's right? Which suggests another question. Which one's wrong? <laughs> uh, when I was a student at CTS uh, in one of my gospel classes, the very first week, the professor asked me to come up and stand in the middle of the room. It's like, uh, okay. And then she asked all the other students to write down a description of me based on only what they could see. Of course, um, their descriptions were different. <laughs> As an example, those that were in front of me wrote down that I was wearing glasses. The people behind me did not. And the person that was like right next to me in front of me even put the color of my eyes <laughs> because they were that much closer. She did this, she said, to help us understand perspective. None of these uh, descriptions of me were wrong, but they were all very, very different. Um, each individual kind of gave their perspective, right? That's what they wrote down, just from their, their perspective. And if we look at perspective from another point of view, um, I am a mom, a, a grandmother, a wife, a mother-in-law, a friend, a sister, a pastor, just to name a few. And if you went to people that I have those relationships with and asked them to describe me, 
they would describe me based on how they have known me in that particular role or in that particular relationship. And it would also kind of be colored by what they wanted you to know about me. So that's another way for us to look at perspective. Again, their, their descriptions would be very different, but they wouldn't be wrong. They would just differ based on their perspective. So I want us to keep that understanding of perspective in our minds as we look at the different Gospels throughout this Lenten season, uh, but also any time <laughs> we go to Scripture. I mean, it's even in the Old Testament we have some of those uh, differing stories as well. I think if we find, you know, instead of trying to look for what's missing or what's wrong or just what's different, if we really try to read all of the versions and uh, let them speak to us individually, we will get a clearer vision of who Jesus is. But I want us today to look uh, real quick at the place that this story happens, and um, that is the temple. Now, I don't know how much you know about the temple uh, in uh, Jesus' time, but it was enormous. It was like 12 football fields end to end enormous. Yeah, that's big, isn't it? That's really big. <laughs> um, A.J. Levine tells us the temple at the time of Jesus was many things. It was a house of prayer for all nations, as we hear in Mark. It was the site of the three pilgrimage festivals. It was a symbol of Jewish tradition. We might think of it as comparable to, uh, to, for the Jewish people at that time, as to how Americans might see the Statue of Liberty. It was the National Bank. It was the only place in the Jewish world where you could sacrifice, uh, make your sacrifices, offer your sacrifices. So this is why Jesus is actually in the outer court um, as he has come into the temple. It's called the Court of the Gentiles. This is where the vendors are. This is where the money changers are because people are going to need to do these things in order to get what they need for their sacrifices as they go uh, deeper into the temple. Uh, money changers were there because uh, most people came in with Roman coins because that's what was used on the outside. And that had to get changed then into uh, the, the currency that was used just within the temple. So during this festival of the Passover for uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the temple is packed with people, just as the city is. Uh, bustling, noisy, all kinds of things. Levine says the noise was loud and boisterous. And because it was Passover, people were happy because they were celebrating the Feast of Freedom. We might think of the setting as a type of vacation for the pilgrims, a chance to leave their homes, to catch up with friends and relatives, to see the big city, and to feel a special connection with their fellow Jews and with God. So that makes it, I think, even more, um, really stands out. If, if we're going to put ourselves in that picture, um, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, there's one atmosphere and then someone comes along and does something that just doesn't seem to fit in? Because that was Jesus on this day. Jesus is in this outer court, the court of the Gentiles. There are the merchants and, and, and the money changers. They're set up there. And Jesus, um, you know, his actions are different. And I think maybe before I told you just how big the temple was, I think many of us, probably because Hollywood helps us think this way, that everybody in the temple just stopped when Jesus overturned that first table, right? But when you think about how big the temple was and how many people were there, this really affected a very small percentage of probably the thousands that were gathered in the temple that day. Levine tells us Jesus' actions are more symbolic than practical. For me, as a non-Jew, as a Gentile, which all of us are, um, I think there's significance in the fact that this happens out there in the outer court where everyone, anyone, could see his actions. It's true that the Jews um, were the only ones allowed to go past this point, deeper into the temple, but the outer court was so, so important. Uh, this is the place where all were welcome. Men, women, rich, poor, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, everyone was welcome to the temple, and it was important um, that that atmosphere was there in this outer court. The Torah instructed the Jewish people that they were to love one another and love the stranger. 
love and welcome was to be encompassed by all. And so the temple is the place, especially this outer court, that's where that was lived out. That is where it was practiced. I also want to give you a little side note that in none of the Gospels is there any indication that the vendors were overcharging anyone or exploiting anyone. Um, this story then is not actually about Jesus' protest of these merchants cheating the poor. You may have been taught that. I know I was. <laughs> so in each of the Gospels, Jesus' actions are portrayed also uh, violent or on the verge of violence. At the very least, he's angry and full of zeal or passion, depending on the translation. It is in John's Gospel that he actually fashions a whip uh, and chases uh, the merchants and the money changers out of the temple with this whip. But Mark's version is a little less aggressive. <laughs> Here he, he simply flips over the tables, and then he takes it as a teaching moment. Mark eleven seventeen says, He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, I was taught, and I know some of you, that this reference to den of robbers is the focus of, this, of the text, and that this tells us that these merchants and money changers were robbing the patrons. But that's not exactly what it says. <laughs> a den of robbers, uh, a more accurate um, translation would be a cave. So this is where the robbers go after they've robbed people. This is their hangout. This is where they get all their loot and go just hang with each other. This is not where they rob people. This is where they go after they've robbed people. I don't know if you've ever thought of the church as a den of robbers. Jesus is, is uh, referencing Jeremiah 7. Levine tells us that Jer the Jeremiah passage depicts the ancient prophet as condemning the people of his own time the time right before the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple over 500 years earlier. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are safe, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Some people in Jeremiah's time and in Jesus' time and in our time today, um, I think take that divine mercy that God offers for granted. And they look at worship as a place just to come and hang out with friends or a place to come and show off new clothes instead of a place to come and be called to clothe the naked. Uh, this present day comparison for what uh, Jesus and Jeremiah are condemning is, is kind of easy to see, right? This is a, a church member who has g goes about sinning all week long, whether it's doing something wrong or not doing what is right. <laughs> you know, that sometimes that sin of omission. Um, and then they come in on Sunday, and the same individual perhaps convinced of their righteousness simply because they've shown up at church, um, heartily sing the hymns and shake all the hands and, and very proudly slip a 50 into the offering plate. That is the kind of behavior that makes it a den of robbers, a cave for sinners, a safe place for those who choose not to repent or to truly follow Jesus. It's a place where the church becomes more of a place for showboating than fishing for men. In the ancient temple, as in the present day church, what it should be is a place where people not only find community, but welcome the stranger and know the error of their ways and are willing to repent to make promises to live godly lives and then through what they learn in this place and the support of one another, keep those promises. 
So why is Jesus so upset if he's not upset because the Jews are being cheated and robbed? It's because Jesus recognized the hearts of those in the temple that day. They're not devoted to God. So Jesus shows this righteous anger, this holy anger, as it's often referred to. Not because people are being taken, but because people are not giving their hearts. Levine distinguishes righteous anger seeks restitution, not revenge. It seeks correction, not retribution. Jesus wanted the temple then and the church today to be a house of prayer for all people, a place where everyone is welcome. Everyone is wrapped in that connection with God that we have through prayer. And he was willing to risk showing his anger, his holy anger, to make his point. Will you pray with me? Holy One, I know many folks have a hard time with this text, wondering why you would get so angry. But it must have broken your heart, Lord, to see those that really didn't care about the, the sacrifices and the offerings, but just about the money. Those who didn't recognize you, who never intended to follow you, and weren't even paying that much attention to your Father. Forgive us, O oh God, for I'm sure I have, and at a time maybe many of us, Lord, have done the same. But help us, O oh God, to make this a house of prayer for all people. Help us to repent and to live into the promises you call us to. And through Christ we pray. Amen. I don't know if you've ever experienced righteous anger yourself. I have known some people who said it was righteous anger, and it really, there wasn't anything righteous about it. <laughs> so we have to be careful when we come to that. When I grew up, uh, there was a lot of anger in my household. Um, my father spoke a lot in anger, and my sister spoke a lot in anger. And I can remember for a very long time, I refused to allow myself to be angry because I saw how they made people feel when they did. But what I learned once I became an adult, with a little counseling, that you got to get angry sometimes. <laughs> it's not healthy not to allow yourselves to be angry. When you see terrible things happening in the world, it should make us angry. It should make us angry. At the very least, it should break our hearts. I know a lot of folks have trouble seeing Jesus as angry, but maybe knowing that it was because of what he was seeing in hearts instead of the money that was being exchanged might change your view of that. We come to this table every week to be reminded of Jesus in all of his ministry, his life, his last week, and all that happened in that, his death, and his resurrection. Darkness and struggle, but also joy, grace, and forgiveness. Jesus sets the table so all are welcome. doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or any church. If you seek the love and grace that Christ so freely gives, you are welcome at the feast. We're going to sing to prepare our hearts for communion. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Jesus and his disciples were gathered there in a large upper room towards the end of this week we are looking at. The way things had gone, the disciples thought, Jesus is running those Romans out of town. But Jesus knew that wasn't the kin kingdom he was bringing to earth. He tried to explain it to them. And either because they couldn't comprehend or they chose not to. They were not prepared for what was before them. But Jesus knew. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that Peter, Peter was going to deny he'd ever even known him. He knew about what was going to happen in the garden, and he knew about the trial, and he knew about the cross. He knew about the grave. But beyond all of that, he also knew about resurrection. And he knew about the power of resurrection to be light and life back into the world. The joy of that he kept him there for that one last supper. He stood and he took bread and he lifted it to heaven and blessed it. He broke it and he passed it among them. He told them, take and eat of this, all of you. This represents my body given in sacrifice for you. I ask that when you do this in the future, you remember me and my love for you. Towards the end of the meal, he stood again and he took a cup and he lifted that to heaven and blessed it. And he passed that among them. Telling them, take and drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. And when you do this, remember me and my love for you. In just a moment, when we hear the music, I'm going to encourage you to take the bread that's in the bottom of your cup. But we're going to hold the juice and take that together. Taking the bread individually reminds us that we are called to have an individual relationship with Christ. But holding this juice and taking it as the body reminds us of that call to be the body of Christ as well. For these gifts, let us pray. Dearest Holy One, thank you for this beautiful place of worship and the wonderful people and relationships that we have made here. As we take the bread, a symbol of your broken body, and the cup, your shed blood, help us to turn our frustration and our anger into positive energy so that we can be loving witnesses of grace and forgiveness to others. Help us to live and to stand up for our beliefs in a way that is pleasing to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let us now partake as one in the body of Christ. And through his blood we are made new. Our cups are empty. Our hearts are filled. Having been blessed by a time of communion, we come time uh, now in our service where we give back to God. Uh, a time where we bring forth our offering, our tithes, um, it's a little bit of what God has given us and asked us to be good stewards of. We now return back to the Lord. Praise God from Yeah. 
please pray with me. Thank you, God, for these tithes and offerings. This week, help us to remember how truly blessed we are so that we give generously of our time, our talents, and our treasures when we see or hear of someone in need. As we go about our daily lives, help us to always err on the side of grace. Let our actions speak your love through the seeds that you have already planted in us, just waiting for us to water, grow, and share. Thank you, Lord. Amen. As we enter the world story, um, talk about our faith in action, all the different ways we can uh, present ourselves outside of this place uh, and still share God's love. Um, one of those is by continuing to grow in our own uh, faith and knowledge. And so we do have Lenten class, intergenerational Lenten class, right after this downstairs in the fellowship hall. All are welcome to join us down there. Uh, Jane has a little something she's going to say, and then where'd Ann go? Ann? Come on down. Go ahead, Jane. This year, the church board has selected the word growth for our one word. We all love to think about the growth of children or the growth of our investments, but somehow the word growth can be rather negative when we think about our waistlines or our credit card debt. <laughs> this year, the Stewardship Committee has selected Are You Ready to Grow as the theme for our pledge campaign. In the next few weeks, you'll be hearing from speakers about how your annual pledges are used to pay, pay for church staff, fund our programs and missions, and maintain this beautiful building. You will receive a pledge card in March so you can make your financial commitment for the 2024-25 church year. Each week, I'm going to put some different ideas on here about other things that you can do. The committee also wants to remind you that giving is a part of your spiritual journey. Not only giving money, but also giving of your time and talents. During Lent, instead of giving up something, Maybe it's the perfect time for you to determine how you can give more of your money, your time, and your talents to the church. How about attending the intergenerational study during the discipleship hour or a Wednesday night Bible study? Maybe you could help serve community table, volunteer to help with VBS, or visit one of our homebound members. Maybe you could sign up for the 24-hour prayer chain. My list goes on and on. Also, think about when that nominating committee calls and asks you to be a committee chair, a deacon, or an elder. Say yes. Are you ready to grow? Thank you, Jane. Anne's going to give us another opportunity to grow. <laughs> the mission committee is uh, happy to announce that we got a intergenerational, any age, any ability, uh, um, mission trip, and I want you to save the date, Saturday, April 27th. I'll have all the details soon, but I want you to save that on your calendar, leave it open, because we have a real fun, like I say, intergenerational, close here at hand, um, uh, mission trip that we can do. And today is uh, Soup Sunday, so you can help fund these mission trips, okay? Speaking of growing our waistlines. Uh, well, yeah. no, the, all the calories are taken out of the soup. Yeah. I, I heard that earlier. Oh, yeah. They're all good. <laughs> so my challenge for you for this week is to examine your own heart. Whether by coming here you make this a house of worship, a house of prayer for all people, or by coming here do you sometimes make it a den of robbers? Only each of us can answer that. Uh, we're going to close our worship with My Hope is Built. Oh, 